thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you much for the opportunity. Salamatia and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, um, my name is Piotr Pietrzak and currently I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Arlianga University under the supervision of uh, Professor Dugis. Um, my main research relates to the Indonesian policy towards um, Russian conflict in Ukraine and China's expansionist actions in the South China Sea, Pacific Ocean and o o Oce Oceania. Uh, and um, in general, to start with, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, Professor uh, Vincencio Dugis and everyone uh, present at Surabaya today. Uh, that's that's great opportunity for me to present in front of you. It's a great honor and privilege uh, for me to present the latest uh, fruits of my uh, research to you today. Uh, thank you, dear students, for uh, for your time, and uh, thank you, the members of faculty of uh, social and political science at Arlianga University, uh, for uh, giving me this chance. And um, you say in your local language, uh, terima kash. I don't know if my pronunciation is correct, but but that that's 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 uh, how I um, would like to thank you for for the floor. My name is Piotr Pietrzak, like I've mentioned before. Uh, I've recently graduated my PhD in philosophy, political philosophy. Um, I studied at Sofia University, before that at Manchester University. Um, I'm originally from Poland. Uh, so I studied in University of Warmia and Missouri in Olsztyn, uh, in Poland. And I also had some scholarship uh, exchanges in University of Cyprus. So basically I studied in four, five different countries now. And uh, today I will present you the fruits of my recent research, as a matter of fact. So uh, kind of 12 years in, or 12, 15 years in, uh, in 45 minutes, of, of uh, your valuable time. And um, what I want to uh, tell you, um, my job uh, today is to um, persuade you that studying IR theory is actually, can be actually fun. Uh, you can enjoy it, despite of the fact that, you know, in general, studying theories might be, um, might sound like something which could be boring, especially for uh, the, beginner, be the beginners. Uh, but it's a very re rewarding thing. And from my perspective, studying IR theories like, and, and uh, contemporary conflicts like climbing Mount Everest. Uh, it is very challenging, um, but rewarding endeavor. And uh, I still don't know where where I am in this in this uh, endeavor, where, where but I I still haven't reached the peak, so I'm perhaps somewhere in the beginning, uh, somewhere at uh, five thousand meter or six thousand meter. Um, in order to reach the peak, you need to have expertise and uh, commit a considerable amount of time and uh, and passion and and uh, be like Professor Dugis. Uh, whom um, basically articles I read, he, he is exceptional IR scholar, and it is a privilege for me to be under his supervision. Um, today's agenda, uh, basically today's agenda will discuss a couple of things. First of all, I will show you that uh, particular uh, IR theories, approaches and paradigms can be interesting. Uh, so we'll go through some of them uh, or most of them uh, then we will discuss most of the strengths and limitations of IR theory. Um, we will check the current compartmentalization of IR theory, uh, and uh, we will um, briefly bring to uh, to the di discussion the main currents of the first, second, third, and the fourth great debate. Subsequently, I will introduce you to the. Uh, term which I which I recently uh, coined, which is called ontology in Satuna Sandy, which is basically compartmentalization of IR theories, a different one, uh, which is more approachable to, uh, to young adepts of IR theory. From my perspective, theory and practice uh, cannot be separated. In order to be a good uh, IR researcher, 
you need to go through all of the um, basically preparations. So as you as you perhaps know, it's it's a it might be dreadful process, but we will uh, we will prove you wrong in this aspect basically. Um, like I like I've mentioned before, uh, what I try to uh, offer you today is something which which is uh, related to my uh, last 11 12 even 13 years of my research so so um uh, this this could be beneficial for for someone who is interested in particular ir theories or in general in the uh, grand theories as you perhaps realize there is a fundamental difference between realism liberalism marxism social constructivism post-structuralism post-colonialism and feminism those are like perhaps leading theories um, I will make sure to share this presentation with, with you, dear students, so you will have it uh, handy. And um, for instance, realism and liberalism, they are like leading theories. Realism is very often uh, seen as a traditional IR theory, uh, whereas liberalism used to be idealistic, now it's more, uh, more let's say, pragmatic, but it depends on the, on the shade of the of the IR theory. If if you if you are fans of Game of Thrones, uh, um, you can you can imagine that um, each and every IR theory or approach represents different families um, I I who are internally conflicted, who fight for dominance, basically. Um, what I try to achieve is to and make sure that learning IR theories is fun or it should be fun because I, I'm a father of four year old and I know that it's sometimes difficult to to persuade a young mind to to stay focused on certain things but it is rewarding so um, for untrained eyes of young political theories um, IR theory may be um, quite complicated um, and uh, like I like I said, uh, it may appear to be internally conflicted, and uh, sometimes you don't understand why there is such a conf uh, conflict of interest between various isms, various paradigms, various uh, international relations theories. Basically, um, <clears throat> some say that IR theory is uh, so pluralistic, so uh, complex, and so divided because it represents all of the interests of every single human um, in the world. And there is like eight, almost eight billion of us. So by default, we can be um, slightly different from uh, one another. And um, basically, from my perspective, what we lack at the moment is clarity. Uh, we stopped, uh, as, as IR theorists, we stopped caring about the truth. Uh, and accountability, and that has to be uh, restored, let, let's say. Um, that's why it's good to, uh, to compare IR theory, particular approaches to Italian principalities of, of uh, the Middle Ages, um, and because some of, some of them are friends on Monday and enemies on Tuesdays. And they might collaborate on Wednesdays, but on Thursdays they might change their mind. And on Fridays they are friends again. But uh, then on Saturdays and Sundays they, they change all allegiances. Uh, and uh, just to interrelate the, the, this, this example, because this is a very European example. In order to understand this example, you need to be a student of European history. So I suppose uh, if in order to interrelate this example, uh, I would say that uh, every single IR theory is as different as 17,000 of Indonesian islands who comprise um, the state of Indonesia. So um, there are differences and there are similarities. And um, the leading theory, one of the two leading theories is realism, as you perhaps know. This is the theory which is uh, very often represented by Machiavelli, Hobbes, Hans Morgenthau, um, and <clears throat> in in terms of the Italian principalities, um, that would be the principality which would be inhabited 
by by the most cynical and uh, most uh, um, um, straightforward uh, political uh, theorists who would say that um, power is the currency of international affairs and nothing else matters. No ethics, no no uh, morality. Power power is everything which which matters and. Uh, power related explanations are the most important one whatever anyone else says uh, it's naive that's basically what 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 uh, um, what realists would suggest the ir theor theories some of the most uh, um popular i'd say uh, in recent years would be kissinger brzezinski cohen gilpin uh, merschheimer and uh, morgenthau of course of course waltz waltz and many others who, who um, basically try to uh, explain the social reality through the prism of balance of power, balance of threat, and everything which relates to, to, to the power uh, struggle between various countries. This, this was a very good theory to, to describe the uh, Cold War because uh, it was pretty much straightforward. There were two blocks like uh, Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact against uh, in the United States and everything was uh, power related. So realism proven to be quite quite useful in describing uh, Cold War, old Cold War, and uh, to the extent is very pr uh, fruitful in uh, describing the new Cold War, the new uh, global conflict, which you can see um, as a as a confrontation between China, uh, U.S., Russia, India. A bit of Indonesia as well, um, Brazil, South Africa, European Union, Africa, uh, and name it um, Australia as well. So, so uh, realism is very, very keen on uh, describing uh, theory uh, through the power lenses. Basically, when it comes to liberalism, this is a more idealistic approach. Uh, liberalist, uh, the the most famous one, let's say, is Immanuel Kant, who came up with the idea that um, at one point uh, our global architecture of power will develop to something which resembles uh, perpetual peace. So there will be no war, no conflict. Everyone will live in peace and tranquility, and we will just collaborate with between each other. Um, in other <coughs> famous uh, liberals are Locke. John Locke, John Stuart Mill, Hugo Grotius, um, and many others. Uh, the uh, contemporary IR, IR um, theorists who tend to be liberals uh, would be uh, Joseph Stuart Nye, uh, Robert Kione, and many, many others. And they, they are very particular in uh, framing the social reality through the perspective of international organizations, the collaboration between nations, uh, and the possibility of preserving peace and uh, prosperity. Uh, from their perspective, the power-orientated thinking in our theory is outdated, and um, because of because of uh, certain developments in our theory, um, they have argued with realists for a very long time um, in favor of. Um, change in, in, in the perspective um, not only uh, from the perspective of, uh, of the description of the reality but um, they are very keen on um, looking into the methods methodology we use to our to our social descriptions of reality um, <clears throat> they are very keen on um, institutions alliances they try to, uh, liberals, they try to always find a way to um, basically um, establish where and when peace and, and, uh, and mutual collaboration would be uh, possible and uh, where uh, this could be less uh, possible. If we switch to uh, the English school of IR theory, and this is a theory which is uh, represented by uh, scholars from England and 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 uh, also US sometimes. Um, it's, uh, scholars such as uh, Hadley Bull, Martin Wright, 
uh, Barry Buzan, and they are very keen on finding the middle ground between uh, between IRTers, between uh, realists and liberals. Uh, they came up with uh, various, uh, I mean, three main uh, areas of analysis, which is internal, uh, international system, international society, the world order, the world society. And the first international system is um, directly related to power politics among states. And uh, they agree that uh, the re realists are a right to put the structure and progress of international anarchy at the center of IR theory. Uh, but they introduced the international society layer of analysis um, that uh, relates to institutionalization of shared interests and identity among states and creation and maintenance of shared norms, roles and institutions at the center of IR theory. Um, in, in general, um, the the uh, English school of uh, IR theory is very popular in England, uh, but it's very in very very beneficial to actually uh, start reading some IR uh, English IR uh, theories to to change a little bit of perspective uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the main currents of the of the IR theory. It's not a classical IR theory. It's a, an addition, basically. It's a supplement, basically. If we switch to post-colonial uh, theory, this is something which um, is less positivist and more, uh, um, let's say, constructivist, as a matter of fact, because uh, post-colonials, uh, post-colonial uh, scholars, uh, they believe that um, the knowledge which has been produced over the centuries is the uh, knowledge which is generated by a uh, hegemon or uh, superpower or great power and uh, it's not this knowledge does not represent the interest of the population which happens to be in semi periphery or periphery so just to give you an example because um as you perhaps know from the history lessons, um, Poland, my my native land, um, has been or was um, attacked by Germany and Russia multiple times, and in recent times, uh, during the Second World War, uh, we were attacked by Nazi Germany in the west and uh, Soviet Union in the east and also a little bit of Ukraine as well, but that's the different e different story. And then we were under domination of Soviet Union for 45 years almost. So in our Polish IR theory, there is this post-colonial uh, school without even us knowing. We are uh, deeply, uh, we are trying to explain everything which happens in the relations uh, between Poland and, and our neighbors through the perspective of history. So this historical mindset defines our um, our understanding of history. These post-colonial um, attitudes uh, very often um, are noticeable uh, in the nations that are that were under colonial rule, like uh, post uh, French or or uh, British uh, colonial rule. The the scholars from from uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, and Asia have have uh, used this approach and um, successfully um, shown certain certain developments in in uh, in IR theory because um, like it or not, um, many colonial powers like England, France, uh, or now U.S. Let's say um, they um, invaded foreign territories they conflicted local people and they basically took the natural resources from these from these nations and they left uh, when they left in 1960s uh, they left these nations in massive debt so and um, this dog dog uh, this, this uh, situation created had have had an impact on on the way the societies basically uh, uh, basically um approach the 
IR theory, the international community, and and the perspective of uh, fr fr of global global power. I recently watched the documentary about uh, South Africa. Uh, South Africa just 30 or 30 odd years after apartheid. The societies in um, in South uh, South Africa uh, who have been who were segregated. Uh, racially segregated uh, in this country uh, during the apartheid still live in uh, very close communities. The Afro-Americans live with, with uh, other Afro-Americans and the whites live with, with other whites and they are uh, basically uh, segregated by very tall walls. So <clears throat> this, um, your habitat very often has an impact on the way how you perceive the global reality which uh, which uh, makes sense when it comes to the uh, IR theory. So we need to recognize that uh, certain certain historical events have, have, have had an impact on the way we see the reality at hand. So um, I strongly recommend you to read Edward Said, Franz Fanon and Gayatri Spivak <clears throat> because they are incredible and that's something which uh, which always uh, will allow you to change the perspective the feminism uh, or feminist uh, my my one of my personal favorite ir uh, theorists um, they fight against um, male dominant um, perspective in ir theory um, they think that women are vastly underrepresented in IR theory, in politics, in society and um, the disadvantages which, which uh, women faced uh, over the centuries have not been dealt with uh, in a pro in, um, reasonable manner. The most, uh, from my perspective, the strongest uh, feminist uh, scholars who, who are worth your attention as are Cynthia Enloe, um, Chandra, uh, Talpade, Mohantri, and Fiona Robinson. They are just incredible. And um, what's interesting about, about feminists is the fact that they are not only feminists, but they, they very often uh, represent various post-structural approaches, Marxist. Uh, some of them are uh, strongly influenced by English school, by, uh, by realism, by uh, liberalism. So it's, it's very, very interesting to bring them to the table because women even even among the world leaders how many world leaders w women do do we know after angela merkel uh, retired from global politics not many there is many uh, female leaders who became the um the leaders of the international organizations uh, but in terms of politics uh, we have the uh, vice president of United States who, who happens to be a woman. Um, but except for that, um, among the global leaders, um, not many. And uh, imagine the situation when Russian president would be a woman. I don't think that women, or, or that's, the, that's the main theory of, of uh, the, the main assumption of, of, of feminists, that a, f a female political uh, player wouldn't go to war with the with a democratically um, um, the, the another democracy, let's say. So, um, the very reason that there is a war between Russia and Ukraine uh, has to do with the macho attitudes of Vladimir Putin. The very fact that China is expanding its uh, borders and and uh, jeopardizes the uh, local. Uh, and the regional um, balance of power uh, in Southeast Asia and uh, basically Pacific region has to do with the, with the fact that the leaders of uh, communist China um, happen to be men. <laughs> that that will be the main assumption of the of the feminist uh, school of thought. But it's not only that. Uh, feminist IR theory is very particular. I'm sorry for my voice, but I'm just a little bit recovering after after a little bit of flu. And um, but uh, feminist IR theories are very very good in uh, explaining, uh, for instance, uh, various sexual abuse during the time of war, uh, 
um, um, prostitution or um, enslavement of people around the world. So they are really worth uh, our attention and they are um, the the pluralism and the diversity of feminists is just exceptional. The next approach, which I would like to re uh, introduce you, is the house of neo-Marxism. And um, I've touched upon that already, but uh, some of the most influential um, Marxist theories are, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, um, Gramsci, uh, Wallerstein and uh, Harvey. Uh, but it started with, with Karl Marx, of course, and Lenin a bit. Uh, and uh, this uh, IR theory is very particular to uh, bring to the debate a different perspective, the more plur uh, more um, perspective of abused people but who are abused by uh, corporations by uh, imperialist forces by uh, who are left um, um, by left uh, by the capitalistic uh, western demo liberal world um, the main uh, the main um, phrase of, of uh, Marxist is the plu the proletarians of all uh, world unite basically so so they try to uh, show us the world without the global imperialist um, attitudes so but they also uh, they are very keen to bring to the to the debate various um, disadvantages of uh, the current uh, state of affairs so um it's it's uh, it's interesting uh, it's very interesting uh, school of thought that is definitely against liberal and realist uh, classical approaches of IR theory they are very revolutionary uh, post positivist and uh, they like to um, steer a heated debate in within IR theory um constructivist also one of my favorites uh, favorite uh, IR approaches. Uh, constructivism is uh, the very new, it's not even a school of thought, it's a, it's a kind of ontology because it's, it's this, it suggests a revolutionary way of approaching IR theory, redefining the things which we take for granted. Um, it presents itself as a very approachable tool that offers international relations scholars a chance to capture the situation at hand from unconstrained perspective that allows taking nothing for granted. Nothing for granted. So imagine uh, the definition, the concept of state. We we know what state is, but they see it as a con uh, socially constructed concept that need to be very often redefined, because um, the definition the 19th century definition of state or post westphalian definition of state is hardly able to define what the 21st century state is so uh, scholars such as alexander went um uh, nicholas weller and um, they are just uh, bringing to to the debate totally different dimension of of analysis uh, and uh, for anyone who is a revolutionary at heart and who is not in, in kind of um, who is uh, very skeptical about Marxism but still revolutionary this is a approach which you would enjoy try it and uh, you will see a lot of uh, rewards uh, after after you try it because it it shows a different uh, attitudes towards structure and agency the matrix of global interactions which which happens to be um let's say different than the one which realists and liberals try to try to frame when it comes to the um rationalism it's also not ir theory or ir approach but it is a type of a way of doing things which uh, involve um, approaching certain developments in IR theory through the perspective of rational choice theory, 
uh, through the perspective of um, various developments that can be framed into um, into a um, rational explanation. And um, in terms of the scholars uh, who are very uh, significant in, in, in respect of this uh, approach, I would say uh, Mr. Ferron, uh, he's, he's one of the uh, one of my favorites. Um, and uh, you cannot, let's say, divide between rationalism and constructivism. It's a kind of a kind of interrelated debate between them about the methods, about the uh, the way we approach the IR theory. Um, and in from their perspective, when it comes to the um, various differences between IR theories, um, we are too concerned with the second rated than the first order issues. Uh, and that was, uh, we devote too much time to our internal uh, debates, our internal di differences, divisions, and we could use this time to actually describe the social reality in more approachable manner. So they advocate in favor of not wasting our time, but just getting on with that, basically, if, if I would uh, frame it in, in the most approachable language for, for a young scholar, let's say. But definitely, uh, in order to understand this uh, rational IR theory, you need to be very systematic and you need to spend a lot of time to to be able to to use this. So basically, they, they advocate um, being this this um, uh, this uh, scholar who is pretty much a Renaissance type of scholar who would uh, look into every single dimension of analysis. Uh, Post-structurals, post-structurals, they are um, they are very philosophical. They are a bit like me, let's say, uh, or I'm a bit like them, let's say, because um, they are um, like I've mentioned before, they are a little bit anti-positivist. So they they try to redefine everything uh, like for instance michael foucault jacques derrida uh, jean bourdillard pierre bourdon ludwig wittgenstein and um, they are all philosophers but they are used by various ir theorists to describe certain aspects of our reality uh, very often in terms of post-structuralism habermas is being brought to the table because he offers different horizon of investigations uh, in terms of the um, Pierre Bourdieu, his uh, his concept of habitat and labor theory uh, is very very interesting. What I can recommend you also, again, I will share this presentation with with Professor Dugi, Dugis, uh, so uh, you would be able to access it and and read it. Uh, um, you you I I can see that many of you take notes, and uh, I imagine myself. Uh, taking notes from some uh, random uh, academic who was once invited to Manchester University or or, or uh, Sofia University and I was very excited as, as a young scholar so um, it's it, it's very uh, I'm very glad that that you are taking this this lecture very seriously so I send you best regards from Sofia by the way the weather here is horrible it rains for the last three days and uh, uh, it's cold, it's three degrees and it's rainy. So imagine that. Because of that, everyone catches some cold and we are trying to wear winter jackets and massive hats in order to protect ourselves. So just to, just to uh, elaborate on this example, um, these folks, post-structuralists, they very often see the realist and liberals as an old school scholars who need to be um, walked away from the from the from the room because they are very um, they they show no tolerance towards uh, um, tradition towards um, knowledge positivist knowledge and um, they are very revolutionary uh, in their heart also, uh, if you if you share such passions, uh, I strongly recommend you to read Foucault, Derrida, uh, Bourdieu, and Wittgenstein. Uh, you will you will find them very likable. 
So that brings us to the question number one. Quo vadis, IR theory, where are you going? Witter goes to. Basically, uh, why this is important? Why this? Uh, why these uh, differences are important to uh, to um, be addressed? And we we haven't reached the the main part of the great uh, great debates yet. We are just touching upon the differences of of IR theory. So brace yourself, folks. Um, in terms of IR theory, and um, all of these approaches, which are which I. Um, introduced to you guys or reintroduced to you they are inherently unable to speak with one voice with one language and they tend to uh, um, d disagree with each other on basically everything and um, that that has a direct impact on the way the global uh, security system works how we perceive nations how we perceive role of women or role of men in the society, how we how we uh, deal with the um, historical disadvantages, uh, how modern um, Western world deals with the with the claims that they abused um, developing world over the centuries and what they can do about it, and this this these differences, this uh, these changes, uh, and this uh, pluralism in IR approaches basically should represent all of us so um just just to just to uh, suggest um so sometimes one may say that uh, when you are an ir theorist you are self-occupied you don't pay attention towards what's what's happening uh, outside uh, the ir theory but that's not uh, true because the very reason why there is some so many differences, so many uh, so many um, various thoughts, various approaches, various ways of us describing social reality helps us to be better scholars. Uh, my personal research relates to conflicts in Syria and Ukraine. For the last 10, 15 years, I've been dealing with these conflicts, and thanks to the slightly better understanding of IR theory, I was able to. Uh, look into various dimensions of of uh, conflicts. Like for instance, Syrian conflict uh, started the recent uh, Syrian conflict, which which was triggered by Arab uh, Spring in in Syria in 2011, started as an an uh, uprising of rebels against the Bashar al-Assad regime. Then it has uh, developed to something of the proxy war. Uh, between uh, various uh, political actors. Then um, jihadists arrived in Syria from Iraq and other countries and started uh, influencing um, not only Syria but also Iraq and uh, ISIS for instance craved, uh, built his own uh, caliphate on the border between Syria and, and Iraq. Then America, Americans intervened to, to deal with ISIS. Uh, then Russians arrived to help Bashar al-Assad. Then um, Turks arrived to, to help uh, Sunni minorities to, to protect themselves from, from um, both Assad and Kurds. And um, better understanding of, of IR theory will help you to understand what's going on in global architecture of power. You would be able to describe international conflicts and certain internal developments in your country because IR theory can be also useful for um, those scholars who um, use comp uh, the compare, compare <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, who use the um, a compar comparing method between various political uh, approaches, various political systems, um, and um, the internal diversification of of theories uh, will help you to to understand the social reality at hand in better way. Um, in order to start the gr the discussion on the great debate. Uh, I would like to show you um, this little um, 
circle because from my perspective every single IR theory is interlinked you cannot just approach it as a, a one unit of uh, analysis it's always in relation to something it's always uh, certain approaches are more interlinked with others whereas others are um, very different than the others for instance realism and liberalism they are different when it comes to the um, to their opinions about something but they are very similar when it comes to the way they approach it they are very static they are very pro-state uh, and uh, very conservative let's say english school tries to bring these two folks realists and liberals together post-colonialism uh, questions everything uh, feminism uh, demands more right for women, children, and uh, they they basically they are basically against any um, <clears throat> any um, theory which uh, gives too much attention to to men and male ego. And neo Marxists, uh, as we as we touched, they are very anti. Uh, realists and anti-liberals, but they are very uh, close to post post-colonials and post-constructivists. Rationals, uh, rationalism and and constructivism in IR theory are very uh, deeply interlinked, but they are very against uh, realism and liberalism. So post-structuralism are very influenced by recent developments in philosophy, especially continental philosophy. And <clears throat> what should bring them together is the <clears throat> hope that IR theory will be stronger. Thanks to our pluralism and our diversity, we should be offering better way of describing social reality at hand. That is, that is uh, hope and aspiration. But the first great debate which happened between 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, basically <clears throat> focus on um, realism, traditionalism versus uh, idealism slash liberalism. And those, um, those uh, two main uh, IR theories uh, clashed and they debated certain things and uh, they debated uh, um, whether uh, whether and uh, the anarchical uh, nature of international politics, uh, what what does it what does, what does it uh, how th does anarchical nature of international politics have uh, impact on on the way we operate within this uh, theory? Uh, the idealists suggest that states are rational actors capable of ensuring lasting peace and security, rather than resorting to war. They emphasize the possibility of stronger role of international institutions and international actors, far-reaching obedience of international law, international norms. After the Second World War, the realism or the realist scholars proclaimed that they won the first great debate because um, they called idealist naive bunch of scholars who are wish uh, who were basically. Um, uh, providing the explanations which are uh, not realistic enough um, because idealists uh, hope that perpetual peace uh, will arrive and, and that liberal uh, institutions will, will basically uh, take a primary focus on, on the global affairs and <clears throat> this debate has uh, was shifted towards the pursuit of uh, reason behind the marginalization of liberal and normative thinking in IR uh, theory. The second great debate uh, happened between be uh, behavioralists, the traditional realist approaches, or between scientific uh, IR scholars who sought to refine scientific methods of inquiry in international relations, uh, and those who insisted on more history, uh, interpret, imper, interpretive approach to international rela uh, relations theory. This debate took place in the 1960s and started to reconceptualize such uh, categories as states, look into the sources of power of states and follow the sociological suggestions suggesting that both the individuals and states find themselves in the structure. 
it was very useful to, uh, like I've mentioned before, and uh, this this debate was very useful uh, during the Cold War, uh, because it it helped to um, to approach this Cold War uh, through conceptual uh, prism. If you follow me, um, there was a third debate, and the third debate, um, this is a little bit more sophisticated. It's about inter-paradigm debate in international relations between neo-realism and neo-liberalism. Um, uh, so, just just to explain, realism and liberalism they are so internally um, conflicted that there is many shades of uh, realism and many shades of liberalism. Um, there is a difference between a realism which is offered by Kissinger, by Merschheimer, by Morgenthau, uh, and uh, maybe uh, um, by Brzezinski, for instance. So, uh, just, just because I don't want to just uh, basically bombard you with the information which you will not uh, remember, uh, I will give you the actual example which you will um, it, it will help you to understand certain certain uh, certain developments in in the IR theory. Basically, <clears throat> for instance, uh, when it comes to realism, um, what we say that classical realism is the one of I mean that's what America that's what Americans would say that classical realism is the one represented by Hans Morgenthau, because the very fact that uh, realism. Uh, arrived to United States in the beginning of 20th century doesn't mean that realism was not uh, invented in Europe or elsewhere else uh, in the world. We uh, understand realism, uh, we uh, know realism ever since the beginning of uh, the cradle of our civilization. Um, in China, um, realism is represented by, uh, surely by, um, scholars such as um, um, Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu is a perfect example of Chinese realism. In Europe, uh, realism is represented by Nico Niccolo Machiavelli, the prince. I strongly rec recommend you, young adepts of IR theory, to read Prince, because Prince will show you that um, the power struggles are everywhere basically and uh, so uh, just just uh, let's go back to the to the uh, to the topic when, whereas uh, there are differences between Hans Morgenthau uh, realism which who suggests that uh, it's all about the human nature and um, it's all about the interest of states in in the in the global architecture of power nothing else matters so that would be the classical uh, realism um, in, in, in the sense of, of the broader realist theory. The realism of, uh, for instance, Kenneth Waltz is totally different because, because Kenneth Waltz is the most structuralist uh, realist scholar we know. Um, he recently passed away, I mean recently, not a few, few years ago, like five, six years ago, but uh, he was the f most probably the first realist scholar who acknowledged that uh, economy and the structure of global power is not only should not only be seen by uh, by um, by within the power structure. It's also economy, society, and uh, each and every um, structural actor, international actor, is basically. Uh, depended not only on his decisions or her decisions, but also on the structure. So that you can see also four differences within the realist uh, theory. Then we have um, John Merschheimer, who offers totally different shade of, of uh, realism. And the same happens with uh, liberalism. A liber um, the liberalism of um, basically uh, um, Immanuel Kant is different than the liberalism between uh, John Stewart, uh, sorry, uh, Joseph Nye and Robert Kione. Joseph Nye, uh, the American scholar who came up with the idea of soft power and hard power, the division, uh, offers something something different than 
than than uh, the folks uh, such as such as uh, Robert Keown. So so. <clears throat> In terms of inter-paradigm uh, debate in international relations theory between neo-realism and neoliberalism that happened in 1970s, um, <clears throat> these folks basically <clears throat> um, had disagreements on how the neoliberal institutions um, should be uh, incorporated into the uh, international system. Uh, both the neo-realists and neo-liberals agreed that the international system is anarchic in its nature, but they disagreed on the way uh, of approaching this issue, basically. And if we allow far-reaching of simplification of this debate, uh, one could claim that ne neo-realists suggested that in the international system, states should be predominantly concerned with such issues as survival, security and power, Whereas neoliberals, <coughs> sorry, suggested focusing on matters related to economic wealth, welfare, international political economic relations, and ci civil issues. And again, that that's very nicely put, but it is oversimplification. So, in order to, uh, if I may give you some um, useful recommendation, I studied this for fifteen years, and I still don't properly. Um, understand everything there is to be understood in this debate because it's so interdependent so interconnected and it's fascinating but i understand that not everyone could be equally fascinated by this uh, debate because trust me uh, sometimes i feel that <clears throat> this this is kind of boring let's let's be honest sometimes it is quite boring because these folks are disagreeing about things which don't matter sometimes. But in most cases, um, this has an impact on the way how uh, contemporary state, how contemporary um, institutions work. Thanks to this debate, the third uh, IR debate, the third great debate, organizations such as European Union, ASEAN, Mercosur, African Union came to terms that the structure matters. So um, it is very often underestimated that theorists or um, the IR thinkers that you know our our uh, work doesn't matter. But in fact, um, when you see the uh, gathering such as G20 gathering in Bali, where global leaders met to discuss the global peace pandemic and how we go about the uh, conflict in Ukraine, how to solve the situation with, with uh, uh, disproportionately um, disproportion of the uh, resources allocation, uh, how, how the um, first and second um, world countries uh, interact how they help the third world countries or developing countries and um, those debates matter so behind every single politician or behind every single global leader there's one dysfunct IR theorist who um, talks to their ears and tells them oh folks how about you you focus on that one because this is uh, important and that's the future this is the past leave the matters in the past in the past and let's focus on something which we can change. And that brings us to the fourth great debate. And uh, this is something which is complicated, but I already touched on a couple of things which in, in the previous slides. So basically, this is a debate between rationalists and reflectionists, uh, between positivists and post-positivists. So those of us who um, take for granted um, the theory, the science, we would be called positivists. Those of us who uh, question everything, we would be post-positivists. We would be like uh, rebels. So let's let's see let's see that. Uh, basically, when we approach um, this debate from the perspective of of 
uh, a bit of philosophy IR theory um, there is a difference between Foucauldian IR positive post positivist uh, settings Derridian um, deconstructivist approaches Gramscian theory of hegemony and Bourdieu's uh, nation of labeling or habitat so um, the post structuralists are very uh, complicated and I don't want to bring too, too much to to uh, to uh, I mean I don't want to bore you with 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 the details of this but it's basically about knowledge creation whether whether we uh, agree that knowledge is to be taken for granted or whether uh, the status quo should be demolished by any standards of imagination what I want to focus in this particular instance is the debate between Roy Bashar and uh, Alexander Wendt because this is something which is which is interesting from my perspective um, so uh, Roy Bashar or Bashkar uh, suggested that um, critical realism triggered a strong demand for the incorporation of ontology in the human sciences sciences this ontology is important because um, it gives you some structure basically his critical realism in a philosophical approach to understand science uh, and uh, in particular social science uh, is important because um, it opposes forms of immense, uh, empir empiricism and uh, positivism by viewing science as concerned with identifying casual mechanisms um, empiricism is the Id idea that all learning comes from only experience and observations um, from his perspective there is a difference between transitive and inter-transitive uh, bodies of now knowledge the intransitive choices would be consistent with the complete preference of uh, in IR theories so imagine that you're realist you will always apply realism if you are liberal you will always use the liberal uh, theories to describe social reality if you are a feminist you will always say oh uh, we need to bring more uh, vo f female voices to the IR debates so uh, if you are um, if uh, and and that's uh, that's that's basically um, that's basically the the this argument but um, when it comes to the um, uh, to uh, the way um, this could be approached you can be sometimes realist sometimes you can be re uh, liberal sometimes you can be feminist and you can mix and match and that's that's something something different so uh, such an option would uh, be concerned with the uh, reasoning underlining choices behind any given approaches that would indicate the individual being that would be inclined to make categorical choices over specific options they prefer and um, whereas constructivist uh, scholars in this particular debate would be instrumental in advocating a various ontological deliberations in higher theory um, and Alexander Wendt with his structured uh, structuration theory and social theory of international relations and his constructivist approach could be useful to, to, to this debate um, constructivism uh, is one of the most um, successful new um, IR theories and uh, and um, I strongly recommend you to to look into that and again I might not be explaining it properly because the fourth great debate is quite complex and co quite complicated and honestly speaking when I prepared these slides for today's presentations uh, I I was trying to do not make a mistake uh, with uh, with certain um, arguments because I don't want to confuse you as well so uh, my recommendation will be to first acquaint yourself understand the various theories and paradigms and then uh, move to the great debates because this is this is a highly sophisticated thing so my, my question to you and I'm almost reaching the end of this almost and because we are in the part three where I try to offer solution to the to the uh, 
current status quo. So how to bring everyone to the table to discuss important issues at hand? Imagine that all of those folks are alive. Immanuel Kant, Hans Morgenthau, uh, Robert Kione, Samantha Power, who is not very theorist, but he, she's a very good practitioner, um, Kenneth Waltz, uh, Charles Bates, uh, Joseph Stuart Nye, um, John Mersheimer, uh, Brzeziński, Zbigniew Brzeziński, um, Niccolò Machiavelli, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, um, and many others. Imagine that we pre bring them together. Um, forget about the fact that some of them are dead. Just let's use our imagination and let's bring them all together to, to the conversation. I mean, we cannot bring them, but we can bring the approaches uh, that they represent. And basically, in order to achieve that, um, philosophy could be useful. And this ontology in particular, the study of being and existence, um, the concepts of becoming and uh, the reality. So mix and match. Let's let's try that one. Um, ontology can be philosophical, can be uh, scientific, can be more of the compartmentalization, uh, uh, bringing uh, various approaches to to uh, IR theory. How to how to fix IR theory in forty five minutes? Let's challenge ourselves. Um, when it comes to um, the idea is that if we come up with the, something which, which will help us to understand various global conflicts or regional conflicts. So we don't do that for the sake just for doing things. We do that because it will help us. Because we find ourselves in the 21st century in, um, in the situation where uh, regional and local conflicts are changing so rapidly, the nature of these conflicts change so rapidly that we cannot capture them as, uh, we cannot properly describe them, we cannot tell the people what's happening in, in various conflict zones. So we need to be very flexible in order to, uh, to discuss certain developments in global affairs. And again, we are seeing this circle, all of these uh, IR uh, approaches. So. And imagine that we can get the most, the best out of all of the approaches. We can mix and match uh, all of the concepts, ideas, processes, and uh, theories which they develop, developed, the paradigms uh, which they tried, and, and they've already um, spent 30, 40, 50 years, all of these uh, scholars, and they, they can all be brought together. Imagine that that's possible. Well. It is possible. Um, I coined the term which is ontology in statuna standi. And this accounts for a new hybridized merger of IR theory and political philosophy that goes deeper into the nature of any given concept because of its evolutionary and contemplative uh, character. And thanks to the fact that it closely relates to the idea of in statuna standi that works as fuel that puts this engine in motion. This is possible if we understand ontology as evolutionary study of existence and the process of being that coexists and supplements and enriches the old traditional study of being, existing and reality by incorporating various interdisciplinary elements from various schools, traditions and studies. So, Ontology in Satanasandi puts forward, uh, it's put forward to encourage, encourage us to take part in different type of intellectual journey, a little bit more um, contemplative. What does it mean? Spend more time with your uh, research. Don't go into shallow explanation. Don't uh, offer superficial or one di dimensional um, explanation. Just befriend wisdom, befriend IR theory and uh, try to uh, be adventurous. Uh, this is my recommendation because this will give you a unique intellectual stimulus, stimulus and motivation to, to be better scholar, be better researcher. And this is very important for you guys because if you are starting this journey, you can, you can basically learn from our experiences, from the mistakes which, uh, which I made which from the mistakes uh, Professor Dugis did. 
just approach uh, when when you when you read uh, certain uh, articles, certain papers, and uh, try to e interrelate it with with the global architecture of power or or local developments. Try to ask yourself, oh, these things which are written, this so-called knowledge, this positive knowledge, can I can I rely on that or not? To what extent this is this is uh, important? And it's not only you don't always have to have answer. The nature of the ontology in Saturn Ascendi is the fact that that that's it's as actually a compartmentalization of IR theories. It is a suggestion that you don't need to have answers, but you need to ask the re the correct questions, and you need to ask correct questions in relation to other approaches. So give a uh, give chance to other approaches, other scholars. Try to think. Oh, how would Immanuel Kant think about it? How would uh, Robert Kione think about it? How would uh, John Merschheimer approach this? Uh, how would Professor uh, Dugis uh, explain that? How would um, I don't know liberals think about this concept? How do I see it in in? Uh, in the long run, in mid run, in short run. So the idea is that the common knowledge type of explanations would be um, basically eradicated by uh, certain philosophical and IR related approaches. That would be a combo which will allow you to be better in your job. So again, Let's go back to uh, Mount Everest. So my recommendation is to befriend IR theory. It can be challenging, but if you supplement it with the use of ontology in Saturn Ascendi, it will clear the path towards something greater because you would avoid certain things which which happened in the uh, in the past over over simplifications and uh, and certain developments which which uh, s are seemingly not relevant so basically um it was never me meant to be easy to be ir scholar and uh, but it has to be um in relation to your research has to be always in relation to something when you say that a um, very simple example. When you say, I think that Russia did a mistake by invading in Ukraine, this is an opinion. When you say John Merschheimer thinks that the West provoke uh, Russia to invade um, in Ukraine, this is an opinion. <laughs> Uh, but if you if you bring more scholars to to the uh, to the debate, for instance, Brzeziński, Zbigniew Brzeziński would say, "Oh, uh, it's against international law for any country to to invade any other country, peaceful country." So the perpetrators of such uh, international crime should be brought to justice. This is also one approach. If you bring more of them. You start the debate. You start. Um, you start bringing to equation various approaches, and then you refute the um, and you abolish the opinions and and you you are ready to um, coin something yours. You you are ready to bring to to uh, to the forum to to everyone uh, interesting. Uh, aspects of various approaches. So, in essence, I, I have just like three or four slides, I think. Uh, in essence, um, what I would also recommend you is to read uh, Mr. Habermas, a very interesting German philosopher who, who was very strongly influenced by or who coined the term horizons. Look beyond horizon, basically. The reader. We know him as a deconstructionist, the person who uh, was uh, very rebellious, the philosopher who didn't have much patience for the traditional philosophers. 
but he also was very very particular to develop the concept the reanimation of of the concept some concepts are worth to be reanimated i recently published a book on on the idea of humanitarian intervention the concept which is uh, highly dismissed by uh, various ir scholars but there are sir, the, it, it's it's interesting to 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 approach it uh, to look into that again um hegelian dialectic as a philosopher at heart i strongly recommend you to read hegel as well because there is something interesting in him his dialectic the the idea that there is a thesis to every thesis there is an antithesis and when you in the process you you can uh, reach the synthesis so this is this is also very useful for the for young scholars of ir theory and hegel is not very very well appreciated by anglo-saxon world uh, but uh, in continental europe is very strongly um influ it's influencing a lot of french um english and and italian scholars Levi levinasian ontology the idea suggesting that the other not me the other is fascinating we need to look after the other always in our explanation the philosophical suggestion that we always need to um, look into the perspective from other people's perspective. Bauman, Sigmund Bauman, suggesting liquid modernity. We find ourselves in the 21st century in the situation that everything is interchangeable. The glo globalization is basically um, changing tradition into liquidity. Everything changes. Pantarei. And I would like to humbly say uh, that this project is still under construction. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And thank you for embracing it for such a long time. Uh, I welcome any critical comments and suggestions. Um, because it's debate which matters. It's not only about you know, bringing one individual aspect of various theories to, to life. Uh, young scholars of IR theory, of politics, the future depends on you. And education is your passport to the future. Tomorrow belongs to those who, who are prepared to work for it today. So open your textbooks and read, and then debate it, and then question what you've achieved and then do it again and if you enjoyed this uh, lecture i would love to uh, deliver more of those for you in the future embracing ontological mode of thinking in ir theory is a process thank you very much for your attention have you got any questions
Mm-hmm. 